I'll, uh, I'll say, boy, preparing for Pentecost, it's been wonderful these last couple of weeks. We had Miles and Catherine Weiss here last week. I thought that was a blessing. Um, that uh, is on our YouTube channel and on our Facebook page. If uh, you haven't, if you weren't here, he has such a deep insight into the Jewish roots of our Christian faith. And Pentecost is, like Tricia said, it's one of the feasts that God commanded the Israelites to come back three times a year. That was one of the three. In the Old Testament, it represented them receiving the law and the harvest. In the New Testament, we know in the second chapter of Acts, it says that a mighty rushing wind came into that upper room, amen? And a sound came in, and they automatically received language to speak known languages in, in a language they had never learned anywhere else. That's the beauty of God's miracle, just coming into our lives and teaching us a language supernaturally. You could say, why would he do that? I'm going to say because he loves people, all right? He, he gave them that ability to speak other people's languages because he loves us. Can you look at somebody and say, he loves you? <laughs> oh, man, that's good news, isn't it? That's really good news. And then it's harder to say sometimes, he loves me. Because we know all the mistakes that we've made. And when I thought about the Holy Spirit and, and how he's changed my life, one of the things he's done for me is to help me from getting my spirit hijacked. You know what I mean by that? How many have had that happen to you while you're driving around here? <laughs> Like, we all have that common thread that there's a bunch of crazy drivers. Now, of course, I am not one of the crazy drivers, but there's a bunch of other ones out there. And, you know, there's times when you get cut off on the road or somebody does something really sketchy, and all of a sudden your blood pressure starts to rise really quick, and, and you want to get angry. And I'm not saying anger is, you know, it's appropriate when it's handled properly. It's not a sin to be angry, but it's sure easy to sin when we're angry. And there's a certain side of being cool under pressure that God really likes. And you can't be cool under pressure if you're striving. And if you really don't know who you are, it's hard to be cool under pressure because you're always wondering what you should do. But when you're confident in who you are, that's what's so powerful about that song that we sang today, right? Is that I am who you say I am, Lord, not who the world says I am. Not who some coach at the football team said I am. Not who even one of my parents who might have not known the Lord and, and spoken death over my life. I don't have to let that counterfeit identity rule and reign over my life because I know that I am who you say that I am. And one of the things Holy Spirit does for me personally, if I yield to him, that's a really big and important conditional promise there. He's there, but he doesn't force himself on us, does he? And I put out one of our older uh, videos this week uh, on the fact that I've been doing, Trisha and I both have been doing communion in the morning. And we just find it to be a really powerful discipline to get on your knees first thing before you eat your breakfast, before you really start your day, to get on your knees and say, Lord, the first thing I want to taste is that wafer <laughs> and, and that juice that's in that cup. And I don't want to go about my business without acknowledging that I need you. And boy, let me tell you, this says, let the peace of Christ rule your hearts. When I first met Trisha, I don't know if she remembers this, but she had a bumper sticker on her back bumper, and it said, this was the verse, Colossians 3.15, because <laughs> we met in a parking lot. I don't, yeah, some of you know that story. So I remember her bumper sticker, because I'm thinking, boy, she's not letting the peace of God rule in her heart. <laughs> she's getting all upset. But I was impressed that she loved the Lord enough to have a bumper sticker on her back bumper. Like, she was putting scripture right on her car. And, um, you know, I, I guess she had a reason to be upset with me. She was very apostolic, yes. Yeah, she was putting me in my place. <laughs> That's what apostles do. But how many remember this picture? It's a really famous picture, right? And I, I don't know about you, but if I was those guys, the peace of God would not be ruling in my heart. <laughs> Right? I, I don't like heights. And there's a picture from like the 1930s, I think. They were building the RCA building in New York. And it's all these construction workers up like 800 feet off the ground having lunch on one of the beams of, you know, the skyscraper they're building. And they look like they don't have a care in the world. And it's 800 feet down if they fall. And after 80, man, you're dead, right? And after even less, so 800, whoa. Like, I don't know, like, have you ever been in a real high place and you look down and you just get a little freaked out? 
So that's just this natural thing. But obviously they had become so accustomed to it that it was a normal part of their life. And that's what we have to do. We have to give Holy Spirit enough rule over our spirit that he's the governor of our heart. And when things come our way that we don't expect, if we get hijacked, we end up doing what the devil wants. And then that's the thing that ends up getting used against us. And if there's anything I can emphasize about Pentecost, for me at least personally, is that I have avoided a lot of mistakes by yielding to Holy Spirit and not saying the first thing that comes to my mind. Because don't you know, you can come up with some pretty sarcastic, quick answers, can't you? <laughs> Trisha was telling me she was just with John and Cheryl Price on this trip. And John, had, you know, this is not meant to be, you know, in, in the wrong spirit, but he's really funny and he thinks of things really fast. So they pulled up in front of a restaurant and outside the restaurant as part of the decoration, they had a big barrel and there was a bunch of brooms in there and the handles were sticking out. And John said, oh, look, Cheryl, your family got here before we did. <laughs> oh, oh. So, so Cheryl has, uh, and she was laughing so hard, Cheryl was, because she's gotten used to him. They've been married 45 years. That she just laughed because it was really funny. You know, and she would probably you know, say that about her family as well at times. So it's just being present to the moment, right? He's very comfortable in his own skin, so he doesn't mind saying something like that, and he know, she knows him well enough to know that he didn't mean any harm by it. And, you know, you have to walk through life with an ease about life because things are going to come your way that you're not expecting, and you don't want to overreact in that initial charge. And, and that's really easy to do, and it's really it's a tactic of the devil. So I'm going to give you a couple scriptures. This is the, the expanded version of that. It's from Colossians 3. But it's in a different version, and I just want to give you the before and after. So it's, we're going to say the Lord's Prayer later today, right? So we know that that's a, forgiveness is a big theme. So here's one thing we have to do to have the Lord rule our hearts. Be gentle and ready to forgive. Never hold grudges. Say that out loud. Is that easy to do? Not easy, is it? But if you're ruling your spirit... You recognize I can't afford to hold this grudge against this person because it's slowing me down and I'm going to let him go. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. And then this is a little expanded version. Let the peace of heart that comes from Christ be always present in your hearts and lives. It's like poetry, right? The peace of heart that comes from Christ always present in my heart and life. Kind of rhyme. I'm going to let the peace of heart that comes from Christ be always present in my heart and my life. And then it's also kind of poetic. In 16, it says, remember what Christ taught and let his words enrich your lives. Because <laughs> when I just got cut off on Route 3 on the way to the Lincoln Tunnel, I'm not always thinking of the words of Jesus at that moment. Some people, his name crosses their mind at that moment, <laughs> but not in a good way. I remember being raised with some friends of mine whose father had a problem drinking. And I said, well, did they ever talk about Jesus in your household? And he said, well, my father said the name a lot, but he wasn't talking about Jesus. You know, so that's, you got to be really careful. Remember what Christ taught and let his words enrich your lives and make you wise and teach them to each other and sing them out in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and sing to the Lord with thankful hearts. And we did that today. We sang to each other. You know, and it takes a little work to come to this church because I keep changing the words of the songs and it's like, oh man, like I don't know how to say it. Like I am who he says you are, who he says you are. Like this is too much work, man. But that's what the Holy Spirit wants us to do. Encourage one another. It's like food. It's life-giving. And when you can be transparent and you don't always have to say, oh yeah, praise the Lord. Everything's going great. No, you could tell somebody, hey, would you pray with me? I'm really going through something. That's not weak. That's strong. That's depending on each other. That's allowing us to be vulnerable to one another and, and strengthen each other and singing to each other with thankful hearts. Now, the opposite side of that coin is the, the negative side of life and how easy it is when people say things, when they're offended with you, they say things that are hurtful, right? And anybody here ever offend anyone? Barbara, your hand went up quick. You're honest. Some people are still trying to decide whether they want to answer this question or not. If I'm just going to be honest, I would say every one of us have offended somebody at some time. And I'm not saying you purposely did it. 
But something you did, maybe, you know, by omission, or maybe you did, maybe you were upset and you said something hurtful to them. And, and that's what happens here with Jesus. But he was so good at letting the peace of God rule his spirit because he was in communion with the Father. And he knew he was a good, good father. That song was awesome today. Thank you, Terry. You know, like every time I hear Terry sing, it blesses me because when she was a child, she had a breathing disorder that was so bad it almost killed her. Right? So to have those pipes now, to be able to sing out and release that sound, it's like such a black eye for the devil. He tried to shut her voice and no, sorry, devil, you lose. Now here it says in Matthew 13, when the Sabbath came, he, Jesus, began to teach in the synagogue and many who heard him were what? Amazed. amazed. Well, I think I'd have been amazed too if I heard Jesus teaching. He spoke as one that had authority. And he knew the Father. And when he spoke, they could tell that he knew the Father. And they were saying, where did this man get these things? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? And aren't his sisters here with us? And they what? They took offense at him. Well, they were amazed by the things he said, but they took offense at him. Does that make sense? Does that connect in your heart somehow? Do you relate to the fact that people who are very familiar with you, if you start to catch some fame or you start to show some promise, what happens? They have what they call a zero-sum game. You know, like you got notched up two points, they have to notch you down two points so you end up at zero. <laughs> like down south, they say, you're getting too big for your britches. <laughs> who do you think you are? I know who I am. I am who he says I am. They sing out of church. <laughs> I know who I am, and my britches are not too big, and I don't even wear britches. I wear clothes. <laughs> Man, they're offended at him, and, and there's something about familiarity that can cause you to be offended if you're jealous, and if you don't know the Lord, it's easy to get jealous of other people, and there's an implication here that because they've known him his whole life, and he had very humble roots, his father died when he was young, he was a carpenter, there was nothing special about this guy, where did he get all this, and instead of being happy for him, they were offended at him. When you're not secure in your own identity, you get offended by other people's progress because you think it makes you look bad. But when you're secure in who you are, you're, you're happy that they're around because you're going to pull from that pool of wisdom that they have. And you're not threatened by them because you're secure in your own identity. And God has already let you know who you are in Christ, so you don't have to be somebody else. You don't have to live up to somebody else's expectations. So on the first slide, we said, he's going to make me wise, and I'm going to dwell on what he tells me. But then here we have a negative scene where all he's doing is teaching. He's just being himself, and yet they're offended by that. And there's something that goes into the spirit when somebody's offended, isn't there? It's like in the atmosphere. Did you ever walk into a conference room where people were before you, and you could tell, even though they're not saying anything, that an argument had just happened in there? You know, there's a vibe in there. There's a way they're not looking at each other. <laughs> and there's a way they are looking at each other that lets you know, oh, boy, I just stepped into a little, like, hornet's nest here. And, Lord, give me insight. Because you were in here before I was. The Lord was in there, wasn't he? Give me something I could say. And, you know, if you ever have John Price around, he'll say something that will break the atmosphere. <laughs> All right, I'm going to go to the next one. It says, Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his own town among his relatives and in his own home. Right now, that's kind of a kind way of saying you shouldn't be offended by my success because all I'm doing is fulfilling the calling that's on my life. And if you don't have the calling on your life, I want to help you fulfill yours. Just because I'm doing well doesn't mean you should be insecure about that. You know, somebody said, if you're a golfer and you watch Tiger Woods, you could either say, wow, boy, he, he sets the bar high. I want to be like him. Or you could say, I'm never going to be that good, so I'm not even going to try. It's all about your attitude and how you look at it. But when the peace of God is ruling in your heart, when Holy Spirit is in there, when that fire is burning and you got the furnace going, part of what he's saying to you is, you can do it. You can do this. You can fulfill your calling. You don't have to fill, fulfill Peter Roselli's calling or Trisha Roselli's calling or anybody else's calling. You don't have to be jealous of their gifts. You just have to find yours. And Holy Spirit's really good at giving us our identity and then keeping us calm so we don't overreact. I'm in New York City a lot. And boy, I'll tell you, the people there are really impressive. 
They are from all over the world. They come with these degrees from all these amazing schools. You know, they, they did like five years of college in two years. Some of them like, wow, like these are just like fast. You know, they think really fast. Like if you're having a conversation with them, you got to feel like you're thinking five steps ahead. And yet God is greater than all that. You know, you don't have to be intimidated, intimidated by your lack of degree or whatever it is because you have Holy Spirit. And he's way better than, damn it, what's really good is both. If you have Holy Spirit and the degree, then you can really do something, can't you? And even without the degree, you could do something. But, but there, what I'm saying is there's like an intimidation factor that if you don't know who you are, you could feel less than and feel pulled back. Not enough. And he never says that you're not enough. The Lord will never say you're not enough. And you might just have to say, look, you guys are talking at a level that I don't fully grasp. I haven't had time to study it the way you have. But here's what I think about it and not feel less than for that. Amen? So all of a sudden, this is, ah, oh, they were amazed. He was amazed at their lack of faith. It says he could not do any miracles there. A prophet's not without honor except in his own town and among his relatives in his own home. He could not. Huh? He could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. He was amazed at their lack of faith. Well, two slides before it says they were amazed at him. And now he's, yeah, right there. Many who heard him were amazed. Now uh, he's amazed for the wrong reason, at their lack of faith. And you know, how about you as a parent, if you have a child and the child's not sure they can do something and you're like, yes, you can do this. I know you can do it. Just face your fear and jump in there and try it. And you know, if you've done a good job building their confidence and letting them know it's okay to fail, even if you don't do it, you tried, we're going to keep trying again. And it's not any sign that you didn't get it right 100% of the time. You can't get it right 100% of the time. And that's what God does for us. Step up and try it. And they didn't want anything to do with it. Their unbelief was stronger than the faith to believe for the miracles. So we have to be really careful of that, don't we? Now, what if that Holy Spirit relationship is very vibrant in your heart? You think it's going to be easy to go into that un unbelief mode? No, because he's right there. He's talking to you. You're yielding to him. And look, I'm sorry if I keep making the point, but in my life, it was a big wrestling match to yield myself to Holy Spirit. It felt like weakness. It felt like I shouldn't have to bother God with this. This is just normal, regular, everyday stuff. He's got bigger stuff to worry about because I didn't understand him as a father and a good father. Like if my kids call me, I don't feel like they're bothering me. I want to help them. And he wants to help each one of us. And then in Ezekiel, um, boy, I just love the heart here. It says, as I live, says the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Now, why would I bring that up? Because in Matthew, you could be upset with the brothers of Jesus who were offended at him and who rejected his word. And, this, and God is saying, look, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. I don't want people to perish. And the New Testament says he doesn't want one person to perish. I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, death of the wicked but that the wicked turn from his way and live. They speak to one another, everyone saying to his brother, please come and hear what the word is that comes from the Lord. They hear your words, but what? They do not do them. They hear your words, but they do not do them. Now just do a little selfie here. Am I hearing the words, but not doing them? That's not good, is it? But come on, if we're honest, we could say that we've been guilty of that, haven't we? So that's another prayer in the morning as you're taking communion is I want to be yielded to you, Lord. I want to be supple in your hands. You're the potter. I'm the clay. And I'm going to allow you to shape me into the vessel that you want me to be today. Because who knows what's coming today? You don't. <laughs> we know that unless you're hiding in a cave somewhere. We have no idea what's coming our way on any given day. And yet, Lord, I want to be pliable in your hands. I want you to be able to mold me into what you need me to be for that person that you're going to put me in front of. Their mouth, I'm sorry, for with their mouth they show much love, but their hearts pursue their own gain. So there's another one of those, like, compass points in our lives. Lord, I want my motives to be on true north. I want to be connected through Holy Spirit. I want your peace to rule and govern my heart, and I want to be pointed in only in the direction that you want me to go. And then it says a little bit later in that chapter, indeed you are to them, he's speaking to the prophet Ezekiel now, God is speaking to them, 
to him. You're, you're to them as a lovely song of one who has a pleasant voice and can play well on an instrument. They hear your words, but they don't do them. So Lord, as you speak to me today, help me to apply it to my life. Help me to walk in real time and be open to what promptings that you're giving me so that I'm open to the directions on the fly as I'm, as I'm living out my life. And when this comes to pass, surely it will come. Then they will know that a prophet has been among them. And when we, when we think about this conference that's coming up, okay, when Jane Hammond is here and the young prophets are here, we don't want to just come to learn about the prophetic in the Bible. We want to come here and be activated in our gift of the prophetic. So you don't just leave with more knowledge. You leave with a greater understanding of how Holy Spirit speaks to you. And you're able to give prophetic words. And you're able to give people words of knowledge and healing. If you want to have fun, just go online and look at some of Todd White's testimony where he just keeps a camera with him. When he goes out, one, one of them I just saw, he was in a restaurant. And uh, the, the, the waitress that came to his table at first was her first day on the job. And she was really nervous, and you could tell. And she was late getting the order out. So the manager came over and apologized to Todd White and the guy he was with. And, and they got a different waitress. And, and Todd White, as he's telling the story, he's like, I felt really bad for that girl because it's her first day. You know, we weren't upset that she was taking a little longer. So they put her as the, like the person at the front where people were walking in. And, and he went up, went up to her and gave her a big tip at the end. And she was shocked. And you could see the shock on her face, like, why would you do that? You should have been mad at me. And he's like, no, I want you to know that God really values you and that you're important to him and that this is a word from him for you to know how important you are and don't be discouraged by this and don't think that you're a failure. Oh, now I'm going to have to post it so you can all see it. It's really so good. There's 10 other stories. Just about one trip to get a meal, how many people he witnesses to. He leads people to the Lord at another table because it's always on his mind. He's asking the Lord, how do you want me to interact with these people? It's really inspiring. He's hard, you know, the package is rough because he's got these big dreadlocks and all, but his spirit is really beautiful. All right, so I'm going to go to the next one. Daniel chapter 2. Now, this is not second chapter of Acts. I get it. You know, Pentecost, you could talk about second chapter of Acts, but I really just felt that the Lord wanted me to share with you that if those moments in your life that you regret, many times it's because you were hijacked. And when you're hijacked, there's a, there's a domino effect that happens. Anybody ever been worried about losing a job? Yeah, see, a lot of hands going up. And if you think you're going to get fired, is it easy to sleep or hard to sleep? Yeah. So that's one of those good measuring sticks about your inner peace is if you're having a hard time sleeping. It's not the only reason, but it could be one of the reasons is that you're really worried about something and it's eating away at you, right? And... We just have to be open to the Lord in the midst of those times because he says, I give my beloved rest. That's a promise of the Lord, that we get sweet sleep and rest and that we don't have to fall victim to being hijacked by our emotions. It's that wonderful cliche. It's not even a cliche. It's so true. I may not know what the future holds, but I know who holds my future. And when you really believe that, this is all just a passing thing. It's a temporary affliction. And yes, don't, don't totally ignore it. You got to deal with that thing. But it's like, no, you're not hijacking me and robbing me of my sleep. Because three or four days of no sleep, and all of a sudden, you're a whole different mess you were than three days ago. Because it dominoes. And then all of a sudden, you're saying more things that are offending other people because you're tired and you're cranky and you're easily agitated and you're worried about your job. And look, I'm not saying don't be worried about your job, but give it to the Lord. All right, so this says in Daniel chapter 2, it was the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign. Nebuchadnezzar had dreams, and what happened? His spirit was so troubled that what? Sleep. Sleep left him. So we don't know yet what the dream is, but we know he is rattled. He is really hijacked. Has your boss ever been really rattled? Guess who gets kicked? <laughs> you. <laughs> right? Like a lot of times when they're having a bad day, they take it out on you. And we're going to see what happens. I just wanted to give you a little clip here just to make the point that I want to make. So I just want you to hear Joseph Garlington. For he just wants to hear from you. Jim Crabb was working on his new storefront church in New York City. And he had the audacity to name it Almighty God Tabernacle. 
It's a Saturday evening and he was making it pretty. So he decided he would call his wife just to see what she was doing. And he said the phone rang and it rang and it rang and it rang and no answer, so he hung up. He said he came home and he said, why didn't you answer the phone? She said, it didn't ring. He said, oh yeah, I called the house. He said, it rang and it rang and it rang. She says, honey, that phone never rang. So he put it aside because they were, in, they were not in agreement. He knew he had called her and she said, you didn't. We were talking about that at the table. That morning, he's back in his office, and his phone rings. The phone in that office, it rings, and, and he picks it up, and the guy says, who is this? He says, I'm, I'm the pastor. He said, why did you call me Saturday? He said, I didn't call you Saturday. He said, yes, you called me, and the phone rang, and it rang, and it rang, and it rang, but I refused to answer. He said, well, why? He said, I was standing on a chair with a noose around my neck, and I was getting ready to take my life. And I said, God, if you don't want me to take my life, give me an indication. And I saw the phone ring. And I went and I saw the ID on the phone that said, Almighty God Tabernacle. <laughs> Didn't say Tabernacle because that was too much, but it said Almighty God. He said I was afraid to answer. See, that's a Holy Ghost assignment right there, don't you think? I mean, I cried when I saw that. I did. It just so touched me that God would love us that much, right? Like just, there's an old gospel song that said, he might not be there when you want him, but he's right on time. And then the girls say, right on, right on. He might not be there when you want him, but he's right on time. Right on, right on. Oh, pretty good. Not as good as earlier, but we're working on it. <laughs> Got to warm you up. <sighs> so this guy thinks he's calling his wife. He dials one digit off, and it rings to a guy with a noose around his neck. And he called his church, Awesome God Tabernacle. It's Mighty God, sorry. He's awesome too. <laughs> and that intervention was enough to save somebody's life. What seems so random, but Holy Spirit's not random. So let's follow the promptings. Are you going to be right 100% of the time? No. But if you know your identity in Christ, you don't need to be right 100% of the time because you're secure in who you are in Christ and you know how to recognize his voice. All right, so we said um, second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, he had dreams and his spirit was so troubled that his sleep left him. And then the king gave the command to call the magicians, astrologers, sorcerers, and Chaldeans to tell the king his dreams. So they came and stood before the king, and he said, I've had a dream, and my spirit is anxious to know the dream. That's called hijacked, right? He's not thinking about anything else on his agenda. Every other appointment got canceled. Uh, he has stopped everything until he can find somebody that can tell him what happened in this dream. Have you ever been there? Just say yes. <laughs> and do the other people always have sympathy for you? No, but you're not the king. <laughs> when this happens to the king... Everybody else has to drop everything they're doing because until he gets his answer, nothing else is going to be dealt with. You have to be that spirit-filled Christian like Daniel was to know how to handle that situation. And I skipped a couple verses because then he gets to them. They, they basically say, look, you, you're not even telling us your dream to interpret it. You want us to tell us what you dreamed and then what it means. Come on, nobody's ever done that. And then he says, look, my decision is firm in verse 5. If you don't make known the dream to me and its interpretation, you will be cut in pieces and your houses shall be made an ash heap. I really don't care much about my house if I've been cut in pieces, but okay, my family cares. However, if you tell me the dream and its interpretation, you shall receive from me gifts, rewards, and great honor. Therefore, tell me the dream and its interpretation. The Chaldeans answered the king and said, there's not a man on earth who can tell the king's matter. Therefore, no king, lord, or ruler has ever asked such things of any magician, astrologer, or Chaldean. It's a difficult thing that the king requests, and there's no other who can tell it to the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. Somebody say, 
Sorry, you're wrong about that. We serve a God who does dwell in the flesh. That's called Holy Spirit. That's the gift. It's good for you, Jesus said, if I go. Because if I go, I can send the comforter. And part of that comfort is you're going to be able to sleep in the middle of a storm, just like I did in the back of the boat. When you guys were all freaking out, thinking you were going to die, you found me sleeping in the back of the boat. Because when he's inside of you, even in the midst of the storm, you can rest. There's a wonderful line in one of the songs we sing here. Matt Damon said, when I am in the storm, the storm is not in me. <laughs> Beautiful, isn't it? If that's true. When it, when it is in you, people have heart attacks over this stuff. People's hearts fail them because of fear. And as Christians, we have a better weapon than that. We have Holy Spirit on the inside. As bleak as it might look, that guy's ready to hang himself. And a wrong number calls. Stops him. Oh, God help us. Right on time. Okay, so the decree went out and they began killing the wise men. All right, they were already killing the wise men. They sought Daniel and his companions, and then with counsel and wisdom, Daniel answered Ariok, the captain of the king's guard who had gone out to kill the wise men of Babylon. And he answered and said to Ariok, King, why is the decree of the king so urgent? Then Ariok made the decision known to Daniel. So Daniel went in and asked the king to give him time that he might tell the king the interpretation. <laughs> Apparently he got that time because in 17 it says, Then Daniel went to his house and made the decision known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Or we would know them as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? That they might seek mercies from the God of heaven concerning this secret. Come on, say that with me. That they might seek mercies from the God of heaven concerning this secret. We are jammed up right now, guys. Don't be planning your vacation. Because <laughs> if we don't get the answer to this secret, there ain't going to be no vacation. Some of the other people have already been killed. But I asked the king for a favor, so he's going to give us till tomorrow to try to crack this code. Okay? So I'll see you in the morning, and we'll compare notes in the morning. And you're staring in bed, staring at the ceiling, because you're thinking you're going to die. And you ever notice that? You forget something, and the harder you try to remember it, the harder it is to remember? <laughs> or... Uh, you're trying to remember a song, and there's another song playing. And you're like, oh, please, shut that off. Shut that off. But when you're hijacked, you can't shut the song off, can you? Because that's all that's playing. You're going to die. You're going to die. You're going to die. Now, you know, he got this vision, Daniel. We know that because if you study the Bible, you know that he does live, right? But I believe there's, I'll just read a little bit further. It says in verse uh, 18, that they might seek the mercies from God of heaven concerning this secret to that Daniel and his companions might not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Then the secret was revealed to Daniel in a night vision. So Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Now here's how I picture it, and I did some reading on it to see what other people have said about it. And you could get a vision while you're staring at the ceiling, right, because you can't fall asleep. But it, the, the, the way that you could interpret this word is that it was a dream. So one skeptic might say, no, there's no way he could have slept in that, in that time because he'd have been too afraid. There's another one that says, no, he was so secure in the Lord, my version, that he did go to sleep. And isn't that beautiful? That, that you could be that at, uh, at ease with your relationship with God, that as, as worried as you might be about something, that you could still sleep. And you can get a dream, and God gives you the interpretation of the dream. Or how about a third version God gives you the other guy's dream. <laughs> Could God do that? We know somebody who said it happened to them, Phil Zaldotti, when he was here. He, he, and he spoke to the person that, who was given the interpretation to it, said, yeah, God brought me into your dream. Now, that might freak somebody out here. I'm not trying to scare anybody. Look, this is God we're talking about. There's no limits on what his possibilities are. One way or another, we know that Daniel got the interpretation of the dream. I think it would be pretty darn effective if you actually had the person's actual dream instead of interpretation of it, right? And then we have to say to ourselves, is it, this, is it the same Holy Spirit that was working in Daniel as it's inside of me right now? Please say yes. So why should we limit him? We shouldn't. What does limit him is our fear and the restrictions that we put on him and, and our lack of faith, like what happened to Joseph's brothers. 
they were basically mocking him and they were offended at him saying, you're no better than me. How come you have all of this and I don't have it? It must not be real. So you get shut down and you get squelched in that gift that you're trying to develop in the Lord. Well, no, you know what? I'm going to be a God pleaser before I'm going to be a man pleaser. That's way more important. And Daniel, oh boy, he's real happy. Verse 25 says, he quickly, Ariok quickly brought Daniel before the king and said thus to him, I have found a man of the captives of Judah who will make known to the king the interpretation. The king answered and said to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, are you able to make known to me the dream which I have seen and its interpretations? Can you say that with me? I'm sorry. I know this could be annoying a little bit, but repeat it with me. Are you able to make known to me the dream which I have seen and its interpretation? And just put yourself in this place for a minute. You go in there. And you know you've got the interpretation. We showed a video on Tuesday night. It's really funny. The first millionaire on the millionaire show with Regis. Remember, it's kind of old now. But the very first guy that won a million dollars was an accountant. And he got up to the $500,000 question. And he still had a lifeline left. You guys know what I'm talking about? So they asked the question, who was the first American president to appear on the show laughing? And they put the four answers down. And this guy, without barely blinking an eye, said, I'd like to use my lifeline. I want to call my parents. And uh, Regis is obviously thinking he doesn't know the answer to the question. So all of a sudden, the father gets on. Regis explains it. He's about to win a million dollars. He really needs your help to answer this question. And then they go, 30 seconds, go. And the son goes, hi, Dad. I don't need your help. I know the answer. I just wanted to tell you I'm going to win a million dollars. How cool is that? It's literally cool. That's cool. Because he didn't get all freaked out knowing he was winning a million dollars. Maybe as an accountant, he was thinking about how to pay half of it in tax. <laughs> but just to be so present to the moment, you see what I'm saying? Now, what would have been your temptation if you're Daniel in this situation? No, but he already knew he had the answer. Yeah, freak out for sure at the beginning. But like this king says to him, are you able to give me the answer? Basically, the whole other rest of the whole kingdom has shut down until the king gets his answer. My, my thing would have been, yep, I got the answer for you, king. I'm the man. And what are you going to do for me? <laughs> Besides not cut me in pieces and burn my house down. <laughs> That's a natural tendency, isn't it? But that's not Holy Ghost. Beautiful thing, isn't it? We can be humble. The gift will make room for you. You don't have to be promoting yourself. And it's so beautiful the way he handles this. And it's so Holy Ghost because there's nothing prideful about Holy Spirit. And Christians, you know, we know the verse. It says pride goes before a fall. Haughty spirit's not good, right? So this is the beautiful answer he gives. Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king has demanded... And the wise men, astrologers, magicians, and soothsayers cannot declare to the king. But what is there? A God in heaven who reveals secrets. He didn't say a thing about himself, did he? Daniel didn't take any of the credit for it. He's a conduit. Conduit. We can do it as a conduit. <laughs> you don't have to take any of the credit for it yourself. He just wants to speak through us. So a common thing you'll hear prophetic people say is, like Jane Hammond will say, I was listening to the Lord, and I was listening to the person. And I just wanted to tell the person what the Lord was saying to me to tell them. What a really yielded, awesome position to be in. There's a God in heaven who reveals secrets and has made known to the king, Nebuchadnezzar, what will be in the latter days. He then gives him the exact detail of the vision, and then Nebuchadnezzar comes back with this amazing answer. King Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face prostrate before Daniel and commanded that they should present him an offering. Uh, I'm sorry, an offering and incense to him. I love this. The king answered Daniel and said, Truly, your God is the God of gods, the Lord of kings, and a revealer of secrets, since you could reveal this secret. Come on, you have the same spirit in you. We just have to cultivate our relationship with the Spirit. There's a lot of people in, in America. How do I know this? Because I've been getting comments on YouTube. <laughs> when we post videos about prophetic people, they'll write back and says, 
If you're hearing any voice, it's not God. The Bible is all you need. God already spoke once, and there's, he's not saying anything else. Yeah, a lot of people. And we don't believe that. We believe he's a good, good father. And he speaks to us. And that's what good fathers do. They speak to us. Doesn't mean that everybody who ever said, thus says the Lord, was right. There's some excesses that happen in the kingdom, for sure. But we don't throw it all out, do we? Right. So you got to vote, don't you? Well, some of the people in your party do some pretty weird things, don't they? Whatever side you're on. That make you weird? No. But we got to vote. So just because you're voting one party or another doesn't mean that you're like everybody else in that party, right? So we understand that there's excesses in, in the things of the Spirit, but no, we're going to stand and we're going to keep tuning our ear to the Lord, shutting out the, the counterfeit voices and saying, Lord, if I don't hear you, I'm in big trouble because I can't do this on my own. And then I'm going to finish with 48, and then we're going to shift over to the Lord's Prayer. Then the king did what? So I'm just going to tell you, as you follow the Lord, you get promoted. All right? As you tune into his voice, you get promoted. And he gave him a great many gifts. And he made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon, the chief administrator over all the wise men of Babylon. That's what Lance Wall now calls ascending the seven mountains in government. The Christians are the ones who are supposed to be at the top. Our gifts should be so good, just like Joseph, right? He came in in the same kind of scenario and got promoted to second in command of the whole country. How many want that? All right. Amen. So say it with me right now. Kingdom come, will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Come on up, Jim and Lori. Give them a hand. This is Jim and Lori Lemaire. They're going to lead us with the Lord's Prayer. Uh-oh, how about if I give you just a music stand? Will that work? Sure, here's the mic. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. I always like to sing, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord, <laughs> before I do anything. So my name is Lori, and I just want to welcome everybody who's joining live on Facebook. Are, are we on, Jim? Oh, great. <laughs> um, and anybody who I ask to pray, um, if you haven't moved over there, please um, come and move over there right now. So um, this event is about the whole world praying the Lord's Prayer at the same time. This is the second year that we've done this, and I'm really excited for us to join together with people around the world to pray the Lord's Prayer. So I'm just going to um, open in a little prayer. Father, we thank you so much that we can come together in unity and pray the prayer that Jesus gave us to pray to you. And we thank you, Father, for sending your son Jesus to die for our sins. We thank you that he poured his blood on the mercy seat and all of our sins are atoned for. We thank you that you raised him up from the grave and you raised him up to be seated at your right hand with all his enemies under his feet. We thank you, Lord, as it says in Acts 2, that you gave him Holy Spirit to pour into his disciples. And today, we celebrate that um, gift, that outpouring of Holy Spirit that you gave. Father, we celebrate Holy Spirit. We celebrate and honor you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit today. And we ask that you be glorified in everything that we do. In Jesus' name, amen. So um, I, I just want to... Uh, go over how this came about. About a year and a half ago, I was uh, fasting and praying and seeking the Lord, just seeking the Lord for him and what he wanted um, to do. And a few weeks later, as I was coming out of sleep, I, um, the Lord, he just put in me that the whole world should pray the Lord's Prayer at the same time. So when I was fully awake and I thought about that, um, I got really excited because I thought it doesn't matter what denomination or nation you're from, we can all agree, agree together as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ to pray this prayer and be in unity. So um, the Lord's Prayer is in Matthew 6, 9 through 13. And um, so we decided, okay, let's do it on 6, 9, which is June 9th. And this year it happened to fall on, and not happened, but it fell on Pentecost. So I got really excited about that and started thinking about... Um, you know, the disciples that were in the upper room and waiting for the promise of the Father. Um, and they were seeking the Lord, and it says they were all with one accord in prayer and supplication. 
And that phrase with one accord is the Greek word homothumidon, which means unanimously. So they were all together praying together. And I could imagine them, if they were all praying together unanimously, maybe they were praying the Lord's Prayer as the wind and fire came and Holy Spirit filled them all. Can you imagine that? Well, we don't know that that's exactly what happened, but um, we, we do know that they were praying together in unity, and that's what we're going to do today. So um, when we're praying the Lord's Prayer, we're saying, God, you're our Father in heaven. Uh, your name is holy. We want your kingdom to come and your will to be done on earth, just like it is in heaven. And I believe that when we say that, that there's an opening between heaven and earth. Just, um, just imagine like Jacob's ladder. Remember the opening? Um, and I, and I, I do believe that when we all pray around the world together, there will be a complete opening and nothing will limit the kingdom of God from coming here on earth. Amen. So, um, I also think that there was one part of the Lord's prayer that was very special to the Lord Jesus. And I say that because right after he gave the Lord's prayer, this is what he said in Matthew 6, um, 14 and 15, he said, for if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will forgive your trespasses. But if you don't forgive men their trespasses, then your Father will not forgive you. And, you know, that's a very sobering statement. And, um, you know, it's absolutely the truth because Jesus only told the truth ever. But I think he said that because he loves us and he wants us to be free. And when we withhold forgiveness from anybody, we're putting ourselves in bondage. And truly, he does not want that. He wants us to be free. And so I thought maybe right now we'd just do a little self-check <laughs> and make sure that we're not harboring any unforgiveness in our hearts, not holding any grudges or holding offense. You know, just in your heart, just say to the Lord, I release I release them, and I forgive them, you know, before we pray. And I'm speaking to myself, too, so <laughs> I'm, it's not just, not just you. So um, if I could just ask my prayers to start coming, coming over here right now. So last year, we had different nations join us. Um, we had the Philippines, Netherlands, Cuba, Canada, Pakistan, South Africa, and the United States. And those are the ones that I know of. So this year, we thought that we would pray in different languages. And right here in this congregation, we have people from all around the world. Yeah. And so some of them are going to pray in their languages today, and then we'll finish up in English. So, Allison, just announce the name of the language you're going to pray in, and then pray. Praise the Lord. I'm going to pray in Igbo. It's I-G-B-O. Igbo is a language in the Igbo tribe of Nigeria. I'm going to pray. Nine Kebine Ligue. Ka Ahageden so. Ka leze gebia. Ka emi hina cho. Dike se me ane ligue. Ka me kutia hono wa. Nyan yu rita. Nkigez rain no bosita. Barrain her joy in the Aimer, Otian Sebar and Deberain her joy. It be colline, ye more. Mazopotian Aka, a jum may in Aimer. Nee and a lazy bunkegi, Nike no tuto, Ubua and Benile. Amen. I'm going to do in Portuguese, and I learned this prayer when I was just seven years old, so I still have in my mind till today. Pai nosso que estais no céu, santificado seja vosso nome, venha o nosso vosso reino, seja feita a vossa vontade, assim na terra como no céu. Pai nosso de cada dia nos dai hoje, perdoai as nossas ofensas, assim como nós perdoamos quem nos tem ofendido. Pois o teu reino, o teu poder e a tua glória para sempre. Amém. Hi, I'm Swarna, and uh, my native language is Telugu, which is a South Indian language. And uh, so I will um, say the Lord's Prayer in Telugu. Paroloka Mantona Matandri, 
నీ నామము పరిచబదు గాక నీ రాజము వచ్చుగాక నీ చిత్తం పరలోకమంతు నిర్వరేచునతులు భూమి అంతను నిర్వరేను గాక మా అనుతన అహరాము నెడు మాకు దయచేము మా రుణస్తులను మేము క్షమించున ప్రకారము మా రుణములు క్షమించము మమ్మను శోధనలోకి తెక్క దోస్తుని నుండి మమ్ మమ్మను తప్పించుము ఆమె My name is Lana and I'll be praying in Arabic. Abana alladhi fi as-samawat liyataqaddas ismuk liya'ti malakutuk kama fi as-samaa kadhalika 'ala al-ard a'tina khubzana kafafa yawmina waghfir lana khatayana kama nahnu naghfir liman akhta'a ilayna واغفر لنا خطايانا كما نحن نغفر لمن اخطا الينا ولا تدخلنا في تجربه لكن نجنا من الشرير لان لك الملك والقوه والمجد الى الابد امين My name is Jenny Tan <coughs> I'll pray with Chinese Mandarin Chinese 在天上的父愿人都尊你的名为圣 愿你的国家里，愿你的旨意在地上行，如同行在天上。我们的日用饮食，今日赐给我们，免我们所有的在如同我们免了别人的在，叫我们不要叫我们遇见试探，救我们脱离凶恶、权柄、荣耀，永远
چنان که ما نیز قصدداران خود را میبخشیم و ما را در آزمایش میاور بلکه از آن شریر رهایی مانده زیرا پادشاهی و قدرت و جلال تا ابد از آن توست آمین My name is Dana Non and I will be doing the last prayer in French. Notre Père qui es aux cieux, que ton nom soit sanctifié, que ton règne vienne, que ta volonté soit faite sur la terre comme au ciel. Donne-nous aujourd'hui notre Père de ce jour. Pardonne-nous nos offenses comme nous pardonnons aussi à ceux qui nous ont offensés. Et ne nous laisse pas Entrez en tentation, mais délivre-nous du mal, car c'est à toi qu'appartient le règne, la puissance, la gloire, pour les siècles des siècles. Amen. And now we just stand so we can say it together in English. that we can see here on the board too. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Hallelujah. Can we give the Lord a shout? Hallelujah. 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 Isn't it, isn't it awesome to hear all the languages and God is the creator of language and he's the creator of the nations. He's the desire of all nations. And so I just wanted to, do you mind if I just close in a, a little prayer? I just want to pray. Father, I just thank you for all the people who joined around the world and here to, um, to pray this prayer. I pray that you bless them, that you bless their nations, Lord. You bless their families. Lord, we ask that your kingdom come and your will be done in all the earth just like it is in heaven. Heaven. And we say, let your glory be over all the earth. In Jesus' name, amen. Just wanna, I just want to thank Pastors Peter and Tricia and um, Anna and Marissa for helping and my husband Jim and um, for everybody who prayed. And I just want to say thank you so much for joining us on Facebook. And um, we're hoping to do this yearly because I just feel it's the Lord's desire. Um, and so I just want to encourage you, keep praying the Lord's prayer. And we love you and we bless you. Thank you. Amen. Stay standing, okay? We're going to... Just lift our hands for a minute, okay? Because on the, on the day of Pentecost, they were all hearing different languages like that, and they understood them. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? That that would have just got dropped in your spirit, because God loves us all so much that he wants to let us know there's a direct line from heaven into earth. So Lord, we just say, open our ears to hear what you're saying on this day that we can celebrate your presence in our lives, that life-giving furnace that's on the inside. We say we're going to fan the flame of Holy Spirit's fire in our lives. And, and we want to burn for you, Lord. We say, let us burn for you. Turn away from the things of the world and be on fire for you. I just bless every one of your people, Lord, as they go out of here today, that they are going equipped to do the work that you have put before them. And as we said earlier today, that we will know the calling that you have placed on our lives and that we will press towards the mark for that prize of that high calling. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. amen.